was asked to speak about education and STEM, two things immediately came to mind. The first is how few Belizean scientists we actually have living and working in Belize. The second is really a question that has come up multiple times in multiple conversations with colleagues, and that is, why do we have so few people in Belize who actually lack the qualities of good scientists as measured currently by publishing innovations and discoveries in wide published journals? What qualities am I referring to? Constant curiosity, thirst for knowledge, analytical, creative, and innovative thinking, interest and dedication in a subject that goes beyond what is required. Basically a passion, a love for what you do. And so these two things really reflect to me the gap in science and innovation that we are facing in our country, but it goes beyond that. This is also prevalent in our entire region, the Caribbean, Central American region. The World Economic Forum recently launched its scores on global competitiveness uh, using a global competitive index that actually integrates pillars such as innovation, health and primary education, tertiary education and training, and technological readiness. 138 countries were scored, and only Costa Rica in our region came closest to the top countries. It was ranked at number 54, number 48 in innovation. So what is the reason for this gap in science and innovation? Of course, as with any complex issues, there's many factors that are responsible for it. But before I go any further with this, I actually want to share with you some of my personal story. And part of it is to illustrate to you a very important point, a point that I don't want any single Belizean in this room to ever forget. And that is that in Belize, and our region as well, we have all the raw material that is required for bridging this gap. So I grew up in a village called Progreso. It's in northern Belize, uh, actually in the Corozal district, but people from Orange Walk claim us to be also part of Orange Walk. And if you, depending on your age or where you grew up, you might imagine what it may have been like growing up there in the 70s and 80s. The village had no electricity. It had no running water. Our closest neighbors were far away. We couldn't hear them or see them. In fact, um, what we had was a beautiful lagoon right down the hill from our house where we spent you know, the days swimming. We were always looking for frogs, for snake eggs, eating bush fruits, jumping in puddles. That was our world. We really had few manufactured toys. Surrounding us was jungle all over and what we call here in Belize bush. And of course, at night, you know, when we went to sleep, it was either starlit uh, skies or otherwise what we in Belize call pitch black nights uh, when there were no stars out. It wasn't until much later that I realized that what this setting really provided me is the first scientific laboratory of my career as a scientist. A living lab in which we were constant explorers. And actually, one of my favorite memories of childhood is my, our occasional trips to Orange Walk Town in which um, I would go to my aunt's and uncle's house and they actually had copies of National Geographic. That was absolutely a joy for me. I wanted to be like the people in that magazine, going to wild places and having adventures. So as you can see, my career and my love of biology and ecology really isn't any accident. It's really an extension of my childhood. And that journey into science actually took me to many places, including as a teenager for the first time looking at the Belize Reef, and that was amazing. The picture you are seeing is actually from Saltwater Key, where I first uh, snorkeled and eventually learned to dive. And it also took me to forest, way beyond the forest that had been in my backyard, to forest, you know, not just in Belize, but abroad. 
So now let me get back to what I think is at the heart of this gap. And as I said to you, my point was telling you a bit of my personal story was really to illustrate that in Belize and everywhere, children are curious. We have curious children who have a thirst for knowledge and in Belize and our region, an unparalleled living laboratory. So why is it then that by the time I get my students at, in final year of university, that questioning and curiosity has just about been killed in them? And I'm really sad in some ways that I get them until fourth or final year. I really think that our education system is at the very root of this and creating this gap in science and innovation. But today I also want to emphasize the role that we each play in bridging that gap, especially those of us in the teaching profession. And I think that in terms of fostering integrative solution-driven thinking, one of the things that has really motivated me is my love for the natural world. A world that is rapidly changing uh, in the context of development. We face many development challenges from poverty, violence, inequality, disasters, economic crises, and those are the things that we need to be able to solve. Our region and our country needs sustainable solutions. So recently, I was actually coming back from a trip to Trinidad and Tobago. I had gone for work. And on my way back, I actually picked up a copy of the airline magazine. And I found this very interesting story. It was featuring 25 remarkable young people under 25 years of age. And one of those people was a young man from the Leeward Islands who currently owns a company that produces an organic fertilizer from something called, um, what we call seaweed here, but uh, scientifically known as sargassum. This young man, enabled by STEM, had changed a challenge which is unwanted, you know, masses of seaweed washing up on the Caribbean shores into an opportunity. In 2007, along with my colleague, Dr. Leandra Choriketz, I also had an opportunity to look at changing a challenge into an opportunity. Recognizing the scientific gap that we have in the country, we dreamed of a space at our university that would be different, that would provide basically a place where young people from Belize could become scientists. So these are some of our biologists that I'm featuring here, and those are the hope for Belize. A decade later from that initial dream, our institute is actually producing science for application. From understanding jaguar populations to, to uh, restoring corals by sexually reproducing them in a field lab, to exploring the potential of sea cucumber mariculture for export so that we don't have to continue depleting wild populations. Integral to all of these efforts have been young people. But still, our experience is that the people who are committed and passionate and driven to do science or study STEM fields are few and far in between. I believe that how we teach, whether at home or in the classroom, is again at the heart of this issue. And I'm no expert in our formal education systems other than by experience, of course, but I did grow up in Belize. I did go through the educational system here. Um, I'm still very much a student in that system, given that I'm a teacher and that I'm constantly learning. And of course, I am the mother to two teenage boys present here today who have been through primary school. My eldest is now currently just entered the tertiary um, education system, with which, of course, I'm very familiar through teaching practice. And so it is from this lens that I really want to say to you that my general experience is that our teaching here in Belize is simply not set up to foster creative, innovative, solution-driven thinking. My experience is also that our biggest challenge in Belize is the quality of our human resources. 
in places that have large populations, it is actually easier to find quality human resources just by virtue of the available pool. But in our country, our little country with less than 400,000 people, every single individual matters. The quality of the human resource matters. So we need to be teaching to solve, teaching to create, and this is both at school and at home. Because the way we teach right now is focused on road learning, on memorization, on regurgitation of facts rather than analysis. And often we label children who question too much problem children. At home, we often make our kids afraid. We make them afraid to be different. We make them afraid speak out their ideas, we make them afraid to make mistakes. And believe me, I'm a parent, so I know what it's like to be challenged at home daily, status quo and my views. And still, my experience really over the past decade teaching is that our youth feel helpless, they feel unempowered to think new ideas, to create. And one of the other things in my experience that I have found is that beyond the material resources, and we always tend to say that you know, money is what we need, but, but it isn't money. Human ingenuity and our attitude to learn through exploration, by risking failure, by managing adaptively, by creative thinking, that is what really makes a difference. So you may be saying, well, she's talked about a lot of things, but you know, what can we do? And as I mentioned to you, I really think that we have a critical role to play in all of this, especially those of us in the formal teaching profession. So we need to teach to bring back curiosity, to welcome questioning, to create sustainable solutions. And one of the best ways for me to illustrate perhaps what each of us can do is to tell you again a little bit more about my own professional experience as a teacher. Today, and also as a professional actually, and today I, you know, most of my time is actually spent uh, overseeing the operations of an institute and the staff that we have at the institute. But I am very fortunate because I don't like to oversee those operations from a desk. I want to be on the ground with our crews, whether it's for research and monitoring, for communication and outreach activities, or doing training. And so that allows me to have, um, I consider myself very fortunate because it allows me to be out there and to enjoy Belize's natural wonders. What are those? Our country still has 60% of its land mass forested. Another thing is that probably right now we can claim the longest living barrier reef, of course, which is impressive. We have an amazing biodiversity. A lot of it actually is still quite undiscovered. We have a system of more than 100 protected areas that span basically the entire country, beautiful places. And when I don't sleep at night, it is for one reason usually, and that is because I'm spinning my wheels trying to think of win-win solutions for sustainable development. And you may ask yourself, well, you know, why is she not sleeping because of this? And the, the actual, the, the real answer is very simple, and it is that I love nature. I love nature and I make no bones about it. But through my professional career, I've also been exposed to the fact that people are dependent on nature. And the more our population gets poorer, the more we depend on you know, what we have in those natural systems. And I am convinced that science and scientific innovation can contribute to sustainable solutions. So that is really what drives my passion when I teach. And to tell you a little bit about my teaching now, 
Uh, my favorite course to teach is an annual course in forest ecology and management. I started teaching that course in 2007. It started as an intensive two-week field course in the Mountain Pine Ridge. Um, from there, we went to different places. We spent from sunup to sundown traversing hills, uh, using long poles to sample plants, digging soil pits, visiting logging operations, and you know, in all of this, students still had to find time to do their assessments, uh, cook their meals, and you know, sleep if they could. I think most students really enjoyed that experience. And if not, they at least valued the challenge and afterwards felt accomplished that you know, they had seen this. Today, because of my students, because of their constructive criticism, I have actually continued to modify that course. And they have challenged me to continue trying to be a good teacher and to use new ways always. So these days, we spend Basically, uh, we do uh, the course in four weeks. We spend a week in the classroom listening to guest lectures, reading and discussing scientific papers, discussing everything from socioeconomic issues to politics to legal systems to the power of collective voices, you know, to being united and it actually doesn't sound like a, like a class you know, about, about nature or about ecology, because ultimately we have to talk about all the things that drive how we manage and use our forest. So we go from north to south, from Bradley Forest of the North, basically, to the southern lowland savannas. And uh, we work with partners to monitor biodiversity. We actually, students even get to participate in things like a controlled burn to prevent wildfires and to promote pine regeneration. You know, we look at agroforestry systems. This year we even planted cacao as we were exploring ways in which we can address some of the unsustainable agriculture issues that are brought on by, you know, mechanized um, large scale monocrop agriculture that requires clear cutting. And so I challenge my students to really think about solutions. And, you know, they do get a grade for all of this. And you may be wondering, you know, or how that is done. Well, few students get an A in my course, but I do have one guarantee, and that guarantee is that we will explore multiple perspectives that, you know, together we are going to learn, and every time a student challenges me with a question, I welcome it as an opportunity to reflect and adjust my teaching based on that. I think that students are very much in tune with our approach and attitude as teachers. The classroom is really your place as a teacher. You need to not be afraid to teach what you have learned, and equally important to learn from those students. So today, I want to call all of us in the teaching profession, but also beyond that, because teaching we do not just in formal systems. We teach as parents, we teach as professionals, as older brothers and sisters. We all have the potential to make an impact in transforming our teaching, to bring back curiosity, to foster innovative and integrative solution-driven uh, thinking. And so at the system level, I believe we need to implement quality standards for science education and education as a whole. My own university currently is, does the bulk of teacher training in the country, and so I think this is a call for us to set these standards, but more importantly, for us to model quality teaching, because otherwise standards are just on paper. At the level of government, responsible for certifying teachers, our major goal, and notice I say our, because we are all part of government, our major goal should be to attract the best minds to the teaching profession, so that these can be the leaders that empower other people in that profession. And at the level of the individual teacher, let us ask our students what problems they want to be solving rather than what they want to be when they grow up. Let's empower them to think new ideas, to speak up, 
thereby enabling solutions, and more importantly, let's inspire them through our own work. Yeah.